And this is important because the affluent patients want to have the state-of-the-art procedure, and if you don't have it, they'll in fact cross over the border into India and have their care there. So Dr. Ruiz Tilganga OR is equally modern. When he does do the charitable cases, instead of working out of two tables, he has one long table, and so the next patient will climb up this little footstool and have their surgery right after the first uh, predecessor is done. Next month, they will open their new wing. And this is very exciting because this expands their teaching space. This will allow uh, doctors from developing countries and their staff members to actually stay and live in-house for months at a time to get this training that they're offering. The particular problems in Nepal are different from those in India. While Tilganga can handle the charity cases in the crowded urban setting, so much of the population lives in these rural villages, many accessible only by foot. Uh, this is one of the camps uh, that is being conducted at a village in a school that I was able to participate in a year ago. Fortunately, it was accessible by Jeep and not only by foot. This is the pre-op screening area in the courtyard. Here is our scrub sink. And by bringing a portable generator and this portable microscope, Dr. Ruit's team can transfer, transform, in this case, an open-air classroom into an operating room where even someone like me can do fake emulsification. This shows the long table technique. After I finish this left eye, this patient will then immediately lie down so I can work on his right eye uh, without even standing up. So the next morning, conducting the post-op clinic in the courtyard. So that portable microscope costs about $10,000. Quite a difference. And as we said, because of reusing things and having low-cost supplies, a major difference in terms of the cost per case. So no question manual method is better in terms of cost, but of course in the West we all went to FACO to improve efficiency, astigmatism, vision rehabilitation, and safety. And so the criticism has always existed. Sure, this is all that they can afford, but how much quality is being sacrificed when you do a non-FACO procedure? And we endeavored to try to answer this question by conducting the first ever prospective randomized trial to compare FACO against manual SICS in a charity camp population. And this is published as you see here. Dr. Ruit's team selected uh, patients who could not pay in neighborhoods of Kathmandu because this assured that they could get the patients in for follow-up and they did follow-up out to a year. The patients were selected with cataracts and no discernible pathology, and then they were all brought in April to the cataract camp, which was conducted about two hours away from the city of Kathmandu in a Buddhist monastery on top of this uh, sizable hill. And they were all brought there. Uh, this is lining up to have their preoperative evaluation, which included both keratometry and pachymetry. And after washing their face and having their retrobulbar block, they were randomized based on the color of ping pong ball that they selected to either having FACO by me or manual SICS by Dr. Ruit. Uh, this is Dr. Ruit's OR. It's a converted classroom. You can see the portable microscopes and the tables. And this is so big there was enough room for both he on the, your right and Jeff Tabin on your left to operate. Now Jeff isn't operating on study patients. These are patients that couldn't or didn't want to be in the study. I had my own OR and through the generosity of AMO. I was able to use their FACO machine and lenses and OVD and even had this heavy Zeiss microscope, which I still don't know how they got to this hilltop monastery, to try to emulate uh, a Western OR. And as you can imagine, arriving there the night before the study, somewhat jet lagged, being transported two hours to this monastery into this setup, I, I just couldn't help but think of the, ch the uh, Asian cooking competition uh, Iron Chef, where Dr. Ruit was the Nepalese master, I was the American challenger, and the secret ingredient was the mature white lens. If you look in the area surrounded by red, look at how many people were hand motion, or worse, these were the white cataracts, and then everybody else averaged 2,300 vision, so these were certainly mature cataracts. Postoperatively, all the patients stayed overnight in this Buddhist prayer hall so that they could have their next day exam. 
And as I said, what was unique about the study was the exam was, the follow-up was carried out for a year and we had 88% follow-up thanks to the amazing diligence of Dr. Ruet's staff. So we have good data. And let's just look at that. These were advanced cases. I worked as fast as I could. And that 15 and a half minutes represents uh, both surgery and turnover time, but I was still no match for Dr. Ruet. I had the only case of vitreous loss. I was able to rescue the descending nucleus, put the lens in the sulcus, and got a good outcome, but the problem was it took 45 minutes. And we quickly calculated that if I just had one more complication, I wouldn't finish the study because we had a day and a half and had to leave that night. I also had more corneal edema because of the bridescent nuclei, as you see here. Unfortunately, by three weeks, uh, everyone's cornea returned to normal. But this explains why on post-op day one, the acuities were much better in the manual SICS group. And this is a little more important in this population who is unsophisticated and doesn't really get the concept that you may have to wait a little bit for your eye to recover. And sometimes someone will decide not to have surgery because their friend from the day before surgery still isn't seeing very well. By six weeks, astigmatism was really the same in both groups, whether by refraction or keratometry. Uh, and this explains why uncorrected acuity, and I'm using 2060 or better in the dark purple, was pretty much the same at six weeks, at six months, and at one year. And uncorrected acuity, of course, very important in this population, many of whom will never get or wear spectacles. Let's look at best corrected vision, again, using 2060, about the same at six weeks and at six months. Now look at this area here, 2060 or worse, and at a year that rises in the SICS group, and that's because of PCO. And I had the advantage of a capsulorexis, Dr. Ruitz's triangular capsulotomy, uh, not as high. Uh, let's go back. Why are we using 2060 or better? That's the WHO definition of functional vision. And I just want to point out to the non-ophthalmologists in the audience that this study didn't show that the two procedures were equal in terms of results. In fact, here at six months, if you look at best corrected 2020, the dark purple, FACO, is much higher. But if you define your goal is to restore functional vision to a poor charitable population that's blind, that doesn't need to drive in the freeway, use a computer, and in most cases cannot even read, then at 2060, what the study did show is that manual uh, extra cap can do as well as FACO at a fraction of the cost and with much higher efficiency. So we give the check mark for cost and efficiency to the manual method. We'd say astigmatism, vi vision rehabilitation, and safety were the same. But I put the question mark here because there's no doubt in my mind that if you expanded this to larger numbers and much larger surgeons with these advanced cataracts, the complication rate of FACO would indeed be higher. I also want to spend a few minutes telling you about an amazing collaboration between private philanthropy and academic department in Hong Kong, a regional training center in China and the Chinese government, Project Vision. If you look at cataract surgical rates, this is the number of surgeries performed per million people per year. In the blue areas of the map, that's North America, Europe, and India. The green areas, 1,000 to 2,000 cases, you're talking South America, Eastern Europe, and Russia. And the worst rates are in yellow, which is Africa, and of all places, China, where annually more LASIK procedures are done than cataract surgeries. And this is part of a huge healthcare crisis in China, where 70% of the population, that's 800 million people, still live in rural villages, and yet the medical resources, including the ophthalmologists, are concentrated in the cities. And there's obviously a huge gap in terms of income and wealth from the villages to the, to the cities, but there isn't that same gap in the cost of the care. And so in a system lacking health insurance, this is a disaster for the poor. Project Vision is the, was founded by Dennis Lam, as chair of ophthalmology at the Chinese University in Hong Kong. And with the help of private funds raised in Hong Kong, he launched Project Vision. They went to county level hospitals throughout rural China, where the surgery generally is done is pretty poor. And they provided new equipment and most importantly training in manual SICS. And in exchange, these hospitals agreed to lower their cost for cataract surgery to $90 US. And he's already gotten this up and running in nine sites with a plan to roll this out to 100. 
very ambitious. A lot of the key work done by his partner Nathan Condon showed that uh, these people can afford to pay something for cataract surgery. And it probably only takes $55 US in this setting to make this financially sustainable. It's just that the prevailing prices are way too high to be affordable. This was published, a pilot study in one of the first hospitals in which they took two surgeons who had never done cataract surgery, trained them in manual SICS, and if you look in red, they got fantastic results when you compare them to what's been published as far as the historical results in rural China for cataract surgery, very poor results. And based on this, the Chinese government is very interested in this product project and is talking with Dennis, who has shown that good equipment and training are key, and that if you do that with manual SICS, you can good, get good outcomes in these centers, uh, and if the quality is good, it is sustainable. So, in conclusion, uh, there is hope for this challenge of cataract blindness, thanks to the leadership of some of the organizations that I've highlighted uh, today. I've shown you three successful different models, each differently and uniquely adapted to their local socioeconomic conditions. But they all have in common going low-tech to the manual SICS procedure so that they can do these terribly advanced cases quickly and at low cost. They all recognize the need and the importance of FACO to have a cost recovery system because the paying patients will want what is done in the West and the two really support each other. But what I find still most impressive is the ability to do this at a very, very high volume using standardized protocols that emphasize a high ratio of staff to surgeons so that they can leverage and maximize the productivity of that scarcest resource, the cataract surgeon. I'd like to close by showing you a, a clip from a documentary about one of the cataract camps that Dr. Ruit and Dr. Tabin did in eastern Nepal. Uh, and it's going to show you uh, this woman who is blind in her home, and she herself has to travel a day or two to get to this little uh, outpost where there's a school where they're doing the cataract camp. Namaste. She has absolute cataracts in both eyes. I think we should do her left eye today. The pupil reacts very beautifully. You see, when I shine the light, that's an indication that the retinal function is still good. So they brought all this equipment from Kathmandu. It took four days to get there, and they had to trek part of the way because there were no roads. Uh, and uh, this you've seen in a schoolroom, and then you'll see the next morning. This is your patient. So the blind people are blind everywhere. They have the same sentiments, you know, and then after seeing, they're going to express the same sentiments. So I think that's where, and that's why our, our work is very special. And we, should not, we should not think about boundaries, I think. We should all think about human beings as one big family. I'd also like to acknowledge the many people around the world, as well as in this room, who annually volunteer their time toward these noble causes. You can read about some of them at these websites. But I'd want to give special thanks to these friends shown here that have taught me everything that I've covered. But I'd want to give special thanks to these friends shown here that have taught me everything that I've covered in this lecture today. And I want to give special thanks as well for their continually reminding me that despite the fact that every year our own society, based on declining reimbursement, seems to value what we do less and less, for reminding me that at the most basic and fundamental level, because of these statistics that you see here, one of the most precious and valuable assets for any society is to have good cataract surgeons. Thank you very much.